Um, hello, everybody. Um, if you haven't joined me for the workshop yesterday, uh, welcome to PHP Yorkshire. I'm glad to see such a diverse crowd, full of energy, full of learning. Um, we're going to talk today about state in the stateless world. Uh, it's a bit a uh, tricky title. Uh, I'll explain why is it tricky in just, uh, just a second. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Luca. Uh, I come from Zagreb, Croatia. I'm a software developer, whatever that means these days. Uh, I do code. I started uh, being a contractor for like four years ago. Don't, don't mind, just come in. Uh, four years ago, and if you think that's that being a, a contractor is like a fancy life. No, it just means that you get shoved a lot of legacy code that doesn't, not, nobody wants to touch anymore. Um, I've also been t a teacher for like five years for, in, in my life. I've been teaching web development. And a lot of those habits have stuck with me for a while. So for example, I'll give you homework. Uh, you'll have to come with your parents if you're <laughs> not behaving or um, you sir, a chewing gum right in the back, so please drop it. Um, <laughs> so um, as I said, existential questions. Why we need state? I mean, we always kind of uh, go with our applications, being proud of them being stateless. Uh, we, are, yeah, we are using HTTP protocol, it's stateless, and we want to build our REST APIs and stuff like that. I mean, you've always been in, in that situation, and you're always proud of, um, of uh, things being stateless. Uh, but eventually, we need state. Uh, we need to store some data from one request to another. And that is exactly our problem that we are having. So uh, if, we, if we have an entity, imagine any entity you have in your, uh, in your code base. Um, it usually starts one way and then progresses and has a life of its own. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you were using internet like 15 years ago when the forums were popular, they're not these days, but user would register on your forum. Uh, after a while, the, the email link would be sent to him to verify his email address. He would click it, and then he could type in. And maybe after a while, the moderator will, would say, okay, uh, this user is normal, we shall, we shall give him more access so he, he can get access to some restricted area of the forum. Or after some more, more time, users who said, OK, he's just writing rubbish. Let's, let's ban him. Uh, let's see if uh, he came to his senses. Let's unban him, and so on and so on forth. So if you look at that, that user, his, um, his state in your, in your forum application changed over time. So sometimes he was a good user, sometimes he was a bad. And according to that, he would have had different, different type of uh, permissions. So if, you, if your manager comes into your office and says, OK, I want you to build me a feature X and describes a feature that will have some sort of states, you would go, OK, it's, it's, it's easy, right? You all probably have a solution in your mind. Uh, you would probably say, OK, I'll just slap a property on my object, uh, call it whatever I like. I can put getter and setters, and that would be the easiest way to do it, right? Um, it's probably debatable if it's the easiest way to do it with getters and setters. Uh, you can uh, argue with me that uh, just having all public properties are uh, the way to go, but I'm not having that discussion again. We can debate that over, over beers. Uh, but you would, say, you would say, OK, I'm done. I'm done, with, I'm done with this feature. And you're probably right, because you would just take the property out from, from repository, change the status again if the user uh, did something else or whatever the feature, feature dictates, and then again, just save it. So you change the state of your entity. Again, I'm showing the one way to do it. Uh, again, if you are a bigger, a bigger fan of um, Oh, I forgot the pattern. Table records? Maybe? Table record? Active record? Active record? Uh, so if you're a fan of the active record, active, active record you might uh, argue with me again. But then let's also keep that for the, for the beer session. 
So storing the information is thing that we all are familiar with, and it's not a, not a problem anymore. The problem comes when the manager says, OK, but there are some, um, some outside rule to our application. It's not just changing the user status. It's not just um, changing the string, string type, uh, uh, the string, uh, string value. There are some outside business rules. So depending on, on, your, um, on your model or, or your system, um, you could like have different behavior depending on what the logged user is doing changes. So if it's admin user, he might have some permissions that other users don't have. Uh, maybe there are certain events that need to happen before some user can be promoted to, um, to a, like, like a verified or a VIP status, the number of posts, karma points, whatever, whatever. Or you can have like outside rules that are, that are also um, uh, important. For example, in, in Croatia, if you have a shop, any shop, and you handle uh, uh, payments, you have to tell the IRS and get the unique number and then include that in the, um, in the receipt as well. Um, so when you do that, you have to do it in the time that you said that you are going to do. So your web shop has to have like opening hours. I know it's crazy, but we come from, I come from a very bureaucratic country. Uh, so the outside rule is you can't do that. You can't change the state of your model from being uh, unpaid to paid if you are doing that from uh, outside business hours. So you have to have like a complete picture uh, of what you can do with your models in a certain, in a certain period. So depending on your um, background, you probably are doing with, uh, with, the, different, with the different domains but these, these rules exist. So how to add those business rules in your application? You're probably thinking, well, I, I could do that with a couple of if, if statements. Um, uh, people are, I see them eyes going up there and wondering, yeah, I could change those. So you probably have um, a way to, to solve that, and you're all smart. Um, so you'll probably ask, is there a clever way to do it? And that clever way, uh, exists and it's a pattern, it's a common, common problem, and that problem is actually a state pattern. So if you never heard about patterns in, in programming uh, and you want to look up and get some uh, like tutorials, books, and so on, one book will, will, will eventually pop up, and that book is like Design Patterns by Gang of Four. Uh, maybe just show hands who read that book or got their hands on? OK, a few hands. OK, so next story might not be that relatable to everybody. But it's a very, very difficult book to, to read because <laughs> it's very, very smart. And I got it uh, early in my career because I listened to advice. That book is for programmers. It will teach you programming. And I read it, and I couldn't understand squat. So I was like curling in the corner, crying. I'll never be a developer. I, <laughs> what is this stuff? Um, but eventually, I reread it again, and I got to understand 5% more, and so on and so forth. And that's, that's my, pro my process. When I open that book, I, uh, again, cry a little bit. And that was the case. Uh, that was the case. Uh, if you open the Gang of Four book, um, it will say about state pattern that it will al allow your objects to appear that they have changed class. Like, how can the object change class? Because I created it from the, from the class. It doesn't make sense. So again, I'm in the corner crying. Uh, but luckily, um, now you have more internet uh, information available. Uh, so I Google state pattern example. And I came up to one really, really good example from, uh, from Sebastian Bergman, the author of PHP Unit, um, and his example uh, about how to implement state pattern. And it's really, really elegant. Um, so he mentions that this approach can be useful when implementing uh, state machines and adding those business rules in your process. So the picture of door uh, is not here by accident, because the example is actually about the door. So if you want to code your state pattern from scratch, uh, here's the short way uh, how to do it. And this is the yeah, PHP just being enterprise level. 
Uh, but in a nutshell, on the, uh, your left side, you will have your entity, which will be a door object. And we will just put one tiny property there that will hold another object uh, on the left that will be uh, door state. And we'll have some proxy methods just to interact with, uh, with that object. So again, this, this diagram uh, can mean uh, very little to somebody. So let's just go uh, step by step into what the left part is. We'll start with the, with the door state. So as every good developer, we would define an interface. And with defining an interface, you would just write down all the methods that are going to be transitions. So if you are familiar how the door works, and yes, you probably are, uh, you can either open a door, you can close it, or you can lock it and unlock it. And that's the whole environment of the door. It's very simplified because you can probably lock the door while it's open, but it's not very uh, common use case. So, so that's the whole circle of life of, of the door. Yes, it's a sad life, but hey, um, at least they are open about it. Um, so def you, you define all the, all the interactions with the door, and that will be one keyword that we will call transitions. So transition from the um, open door to the, to the closed door by simply opening it. Uh, so we defined, defined an interface. A next step, we'll extend it, uh, we'll implement it, and make this method an abstract method, because we never want to use this. Um, we'll say that each transition will just throw an exception. It might seem weird, because we kind of want our um, door state to work, right? Because I said that you have to have transitions, but now I'm uh, banning all the transitions. It's just that in the next step, well, we, when we implement certain, uh, certain states, it's much easier just to override uh, the states that we are going to allow and then leave all the rest uh, as forbidden. So make all transitions, throwing exception is just making sure that uh, we only allow things, certain things to, to, to go. So from that, we can extend and we can have the actual uh, usable classes. So we can have lock door state that will implement those abs the, that abstract one and then just say the closed uh, lock door states can just have the method unlock. And of course, trying to open the door while it's, while it's locked, it will throw, throw uh, an exception. So every thing that you want to allow, you just override and make that method sort of a factory to a new state. So every method is going to return new instance of the, the, of the um, of the same uh, same interface, so you're just staying in that in that field, and you can allow them to um, to easily be, be be switched. So that's the if you remember the the UML diagram uh, that I'll show you later, that was the left uh, the right part. Uh, so now we need to put that all in our object, uh, the main object that we want to handle state and which we can just add property like, like before. And we need to make sure that every time we create that object, we create it with a certain state in mind. Uh, so that's why the door state is in a constructor and we have a method that uh, sets it and a lot of proxy method that will just interact with our uh, uh, state property uh, through, through our object. So depending again on your use case, um, you can have a lot of lot of those methods, and you might say that it's really too much, right? Um, I don't know if you are a big fan of adding stuff to your models, entities. Anybody who has pet models? Hmm? Hmm? Be honest, thank you. Um, <laughs> if you are not familiar with with uh, this, this is a quadruple. Heart Attack Burger from Heart Attack Grill in, in Las Vegas. Um, it seemed appropriate to mention it while talking about uh, big models and big entities. So 
while it is maybe practical to do that, uh, if you don't have a lot of transition, a lot of states, if it gets bigger, and if you have some more more information that you need to check before transitions, uh, it might not be the better, best idea to do, it, do that in the model. So again, dig up some more information on the internet and you'll find out uh, that there is a better way. And the better way are exactly state machines that I'm going to talk about uh, today. So if you, are, if you want to define your door, you will define it like this. You will define certain states that are circles, and you can define transitions with, within, uh, within, between them. So every state machine can eventually have a diagram like this that will just show you where you start and what transitions are needed to either end up in a state that you want or end up in a state that you don't want as a user, but uh, it should be, again, technically correct from the, from the system standpoint. Um, if you want to create the state machines yourself, you want to code it from scratch, it's a good coding exercise, but don't do it. Uh, there are a few packages uh, ready available to you. Uh, the, the list is ordered by my personal preference. Uh, the last Johan Finit uh, package is not really actively ma maintained, so you might not look into that one. Uh, but the state machines and the, uh, and the workflow uh, from Symfony are pretty good and pretty, pretty uh, powerful. So if you just pick one, anyone, uh, you, you'll probably be good to go. Um, I'm a little bit more familiar with the, with the, with the Symfony workflow one. So I'll show you the example of using that. But it, trust me, it's really, really, uh, the, 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 the thing that's, that you are going to learn today can be transferred to uh, a Windsor State machine as well. So as all things go in the Symfony world, uh, you have to first define it with a lovely piece of uh, YAML. Again, if you have feelings about YAML, we can talk about that later. Um, and I have to excuse myself uh, just at, at this point because I use the world's best example to confuse you because my workflow is named workload because I'm running some processes and it's actually called work, uh, workload. So to be totally confusing, I will probably uh, be mixing up those words uh, as we go. Um, so you define your, um, you, so in the, in, the, in the config you say, okay, this is the workflow part, and you just name your uh, workflow something very different, uh, in this case workload. Uh, you define whether it's a state machine or workflow, uh, that's not important uh, right now, but you just want to say the, the part where the marking store is, you just want to pick an argument that will actually be the property where the workflow is going to store the information uh, of that state. So that's the status, uh, status property, getters and setters, all that, all that apply. Uh, next, you will list all the entities that are supported by this workflow. So for example, if you have many of them, uh, that you can all shove them in the, same, in the same workflow. And then you'll define all the states. Uh, these are called places. Just list, list them. And the toughest part is to define the, uh, the transitions where you, sorry, where you, um, where you define all the possible, you can go from this state to another by either starting or whatever you, you call it, uh, whatever you want to call those transitions. So um, you can have like, Arrays with multiple uh, multiple states going to uh, one state, or uh, one state going to uh, more of them, or or, or so on, and so on, and, and so, or so, so on and so forth. Sorry. So that would be the uh, the toughest part. And from that point on, the coding just becomes a poem uh, because it's very poetic to actually start using. Uh, 
workflow. Uh, it's almost like when we were kids, we would come up to a, to a, a doorbell ring and, hey, can Timmy play, come play at South? So you just ask, can you do this transition on an object? If yes, perfect, then we apply the transition. If not, uh, then it doesn't get applied. So it's very easy to just play with that logic. Um, if you work, look, look at the um, constructor of the, of the workflow, you'll also see that our friend Event Dispatcher is here, which is kind of really nice and really useful because uh, we get to uh, play with all the events it, it, fire, it fires up at the, as the transitions go. So for example, we have a guarding, uh, guarding event. So when you want, you can, when you say, um, can I apply the transition, or when you apply transition, or you, or you ask the workflow, get me all the enabled transitions from this, from this state, uh, this event will be fired. And it seems redundant, because we already defined from which state we can go to in our config, but that's just the what state we can go. Um, there are almost certain be more business rules in terms of uh, let's check again which user is initiating the change. Let's check uh, how many transactions does this user have. Does this user have uh, an active, uh, active subscription, so we might not cancel his account, or if we cancel his account, we might uh, refund it, or so on and so forth. So if you want to uh, broaden up the context of that change, you will probably want to use, it, uh, use that through events. Uh, in the terms of uh, guard events, you will just want to check uh, if it happens, and if, the, if that uh, event should not happen, just set up the uh, blocking and you'll get the response back that the transition cannot be made. Um, there are many other transitions, uh, quite a lot of them. Uh, so the typical process when you start a transition, you will get the leave event because you are leaving the previous one and then you'll be in a transition and then you start entering the new one and here's the, the place where it gets uh, uh, interesting. So when you enter a new transition, the, the marking, so the, the, your, your, your state property is not yet updated and it's updated when in enter. Uh, I'm telling to you the, the difference because if you want to flush it uh, to, uh, to, uh, to a database, you should do it in the entered event. And then again, um, when, when it's completed, it's finally over. You can uh, either log that the transition uh, was completed, <coughs> or you can use the, the, leave, uh, uh, the leave event to say that the transition has started, so you'll have a complete picture of, um, of what is going on and uh, what has happened. And yeah, announce will just um, give you the for for each give you the give, you will, it will be fired for each transaction that is available to um, to the subject. You also want to reuse some of that logic in in templates. So where that's, there's a very good uh, twig extension for that. So if you just want to uh, display uh, what buttons can be pushed, clicked, it will all be connected to the, um, to the uh, business rules that we defined earlier. So it will not display a button that will eventually fail. So you don't have to have a lot of checks to check at that point, can you display a button? You just ask your workflow if this is okay. And uh, another great feature that will help you talk to your clients about it is the workflow dump. So it's very easy to just dump, dump it into dot format and I think in the next version the planet UML as well. Um, so you can have like a very graphic picture 
of what the workflow is. And it may seem like just a fancy, fancy way, but it really helps if you are going to discuss the workflow with your clients. They are visual types. You can't show them a YAML file. It would be nice, but not, not yet. Uh, so if you go back and forth with, with your clients, just show them. They say, no, no, we, th we thought it would be more like this. Come back, update the, the config file, generate it again. You don't have to have any more code except uh, the config file. Generate it again, then show it to cl clients and so on and so forth. It's really, really, uh, really nice. And of course, uh, again, people that were at my uh, test-driven development workshop yesterday, uh, please close your ears because I'm going to talk about testing last. Um, so it's very easy to do test coverage of your um, of your model. You just have to uh, have to have like the, the whole context. So you boot up the symphony and just test whatever whatever you need. So if you want to see if it's compliant to the things that you have defined, uh, just write a test for that. It may again seem redundant because yeah, but we just wrote the the, um, the config. Who would be crazy that he will change config? Yeah, maybe just have an extra uh, extra set of uh, extra set of protection. And also, if you all start uh, adding business rules in your um, in your application, uh, you can also have uh, check checks in here. It will take a little bit more time to to run because your uh, in the end, testing both the whole Symfony uh, workflow package as well in this process. Uh, but as testing goes, it's really nice to have a safe place to, 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 have, uh, to be. So yeah, you get really, really nice and understandable coverage. So you're probably already thinking, um, where can I use those things in your projects? Uh, does anybody have an idea when they might be usable? Yes, no, possibly, quite yes. Um, I mean, I'm not going to go that far and say you have to put it everywhere. So if there's like enable, disable uh, thing in, in your MT, Yes, that's the video good case for um, for a um, for a state machine. That would be like overkill, but have it in the back of your mind and just consider if you have like active deactivate deactivate something like that, and some more details information needed to happen after that, or like if I de deactivate the user, I need to cancel his subscription or send him an email or something like that. It's really, really nice, nice to have. Um, if you are working with like um, payments, uh, orders, web shops, it might be a really, really uh, nice thing to to consider using. Uh, I've been approached by one company that wanted us to build a book publishing process manager something, and when they started describing what is needed for a book to come from an idea to be approved, to have a cover approved, and so on and so forth, and actually be the book that can be used in, in education. It's, it's extremely long, and it was immediately decided, yeah, if, if we got that project, uh, we would be using the, um, the state machines. Unfortunately, we didn't work on that, uh, but it doesn't matter. So, at least consider using the, the, the state machines for, for your project. Uh, if you look at like the open source projects who are currently using the state machines, the, the list is short. <laughs> there are not a lot of them. Uh, if you've been playing out with the Cilius or you have uh, been, been building web shops in Cilius uh, under the hood, Cilius is using the state machine and he's uh, checkout slash um, ordering process is 
uh, using it, it, it heavily. So you're pretty well, uh, well, uh, well covered there. Um, as far as searching on packages, who is using uh, any, any sort of state machine packages, uh, they are just like Symfony Bundle or Laravel Bundle. So if you are going to use it in your project and you are using any sort of like modern up-to-date framework, uh, you're probably covered um, or just if you have any sort of like easier configuration thing, you can probably use them uh, out of the box. So if you decide to come to, to work on Monday, not that I'm discouraging you to, to, to not to go to work on Monday, but when you come to work on Monday and you want to try out uh, state machines, I'm going to just give you a few tips and tricks uh, on how to best implement them. Um, first of all, talk to your clients. Uh, don't be the one, oh, I'm going to solve them, their problem by just implementing them, implementing state machines without telling them. Um, Unfortunately, that's not going to work because you'll run out, run in the, into a situation where your system is not be allowing to do something and the client is going to be wanting to do, to do it. Um, so if you are going to implement something like that, talk it through with your client or at least talk it through with your, um, with your colleagues and try to reach a consensus. People tend to overcomplicate things when they start drawing it on paper. So probably if we started discussing that uh, door example with the client, you would like have five more states and quite possible more transitions with an option that the key is lost and the key is on the front side of the lock. And then the, so they tend to overcomplicate, thing, overcomplicate things and you end up writing a lot of boilerplate code that is just going to be like skip, 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 or uh, you'll, you'll have to implement an, like a, a reroute just to skip all the parts that are not being used. So you, after a few iterations, you'll end up with a, with a big, really big configuration that could be simplified. So I'd rather you start simple and then build up uh, what it's what is necessary later so changing the workflow changing the workflow is pretty easy you just change the config but yeah please bear in mind that these states are stored in the database so if you want to delete a state that is stored in a database you're going to, going to have a problem with using that object later on it's like it's like serializing an array uh, or, a, or a serializing object. If you store it in a database and then you change it, I'm not going to use the dirty word, but uh, bad things are, are happening. And I've learned that the, the, the hard way, hard way, not with state machines, but with uh, serializing objects. Uh, so yeah, please, please, don't, uh, <laughs> please don't do that. Um, there are no uh, safeguards against it. Um, so if somebody deletes uh, a state and that code goes to production without database being updated first, it's tough luck. Hopefully it's not a, a big damage and you can um, replay it. But having a good peer review process just to check those things and having responsible people saying, hey, shouldn't we just write some migration first? Yeah, you're right, and, and so on and so forth. Um, also, try to leave a paper trail. Uh, try to leave uh, uh, a log of things that have been happening to an object. So, for example, um, if a, a purchase manager comes into office and says, why is this order not being uh, shipped? Why is it was uh, uh, paid yesterday? What, what happened now? You can go into a log or something and say, yes, but uh, um, administrator just clicked here and there's a note saying that customer wanted to stop it, maybe to add some more things and so on and so forth. Um, if you are doing event sourcing, it plays well with event sourcing because event sourcing is just a series of 
events that are happening to your system. So you are already having all those information uh, that's been happening and the state machines are just um, another um, safe rail uh, on top of that. So have, have in mind that um, keeping a log of things that happened can be very helpful later on to, uh, to deduce why is this entity in this state? What has happened to it in the past? Um, we are all pre pretty much <coughs> PHP developers, but we have ventured into different languages. So the concept that you, you learn from PHP, you will probably want to find and search in a, in a different language. So if you like the concept of, um, of state machines, you will find it in another language as well. So probably every popular language these days have some sort of state machines or a workflow or something like that implementation. Uh, while searching for that, I even found out that one person did it in PostgreSQL. I'm really not sure the use case uh, for that, except for the exercise. Uh, but yeah, don't don't say that it's just for uh, it's just for the uh, the PHP because it's not. It's really a universal concept and. Uh, you can use it uh, any, anywhere you like it, determining that there are um, packages for that. So just a quick recap of um, what have we learned today. And I'll have even uh, 10 minutes left for, for uh, questions. So uh, we learned that we need to store state somewhere, although our uh, business model is being stateless and not relying on state too much. We need to save some information. Uh, try to group that logic in one place, preferably state machines, because it's nice, it's organized, it's shareable with your clients. Um, we have learned a new pattern, state pattern. I've hopefully saved you the part where you're crying in the corner trying to figure out uh, what the hell is the Gang of Four book talking about? So with a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a state pattern, just remember that from the outside, it will appear that object is from a, from a different class because it behaves differently. Uh, look at the uh, Sebastian example because it's really good. You can check it out, run it, just create a few objects, see how it, how it feels, see how it, how it works. And yeah, if you decide to try out state machines, do not reinvent the wheel. Do not write the, the, the package yourself, uh, but rather uh, use the either Symfony workflow or Windows state machines. They are both uh, very solid and very tested. And speaking of tests, of course, put another layer of security in your projects by uh, adding tests that will test your um, uh, test your state machine as well. Once you go with with a with a state machine, uh, so if you are already using it, then enforce the usage of it throughout the project. So, for example, if you are changing the state in uh, in, a, in an entity on three places and somebody in the fourth place, it's just a quick fix. It's much easier to. It will always be failed. So I'll jump, I'm just setting it to failed. Slap on the wrist, no, please, we, ha we have this process in place, and then uh, force it to be unique and consistent um, throughout. So um, are there any questions at this point? Um, I also have a disclaimer saying that you have, like, you can uh, ask questions anytime. So in the next 10 minutes is great if you want to ask questions during the lunch. It's also great if the question pops up later in mind, you can reach me and yeah, it doesn't have an expiry date on a questions coupon that I'm just giving it, giving it out to you now. So please, fire away. Yes. Uh, 
plus plus the the event that's that's being fired. So, so it will run the guard checks. Yeah. The so the can will uh, throw will will throw the uh, guard events, the, the three ones that are that are mentioned, okay. and the whatever listener or subscriber you have should should handle that if it's setting the event that's been passed as blocked then it will return that that uh, transition is not yeah yeah you can you can just shove anything you need in the in the uh, listener itself uh, like uh, security contexts to check on the blog user or uh, query the repository to see any other information that you need, like what additional type of data is being needed to analyze if it's uh, good to pass the transition. If it passes, then it will be uh, it will be returned. I mean, if you if you look at the three types of transitions, there are a lot of uh, three three types of uh, events that are being thrown. Uh, there are a lot of them, so you can just pick either you will subscribe subscribe to the guard event of your particular uh, workflow or to guard events of all workflows. So you, you can really be like, uh, you can li really fine grain. So if it's just the security for the, all, of the, all of them, check the, the security context in one. If it's something specific to that particular workflow, then check it in the, uh, uh, the, the workflow specific guard. So it can be, it can be fine grained. Yeah. Can you give examples of Things that the state machine um, libraries were good, were good for, like examples like the okay. binary and that sort of things. Can you give an example of what it's not good for? Uh, good, <laughs> good question. I didn't come to me um, in mind um, <coughs> what would be like the the worst case scenario, like no, like, like don't use it. I can't give you an answer. I should think probably about it and uh, come back to you. But it's it's a good me mental exercise. What's um, in the car process? Okay. What is an example of something you shouldn't put in guard clause? Uh, how do you mean what you shouldn't put in like, your guard clause? Um, you know, it's like an F statement, right? It's guard, it's like F, you know, okay. right? Yeah. Do you have any advice on in your experience on things that are good to put in there, but also like not to avoid, like make the field kind of slow or it's not the right thing to check in that guard? Uh, well, you should not be checking the things that are already defined. So you don't not, you don't need to have like what the previous transition is. So that's been handled by the the config itself. But apart from that, I think that anything goes. Well, if it's, yeah. why not? I mean, you can put uh, not not in guard, but in the enter state, you can put the uh, query to flush it. So you can save it in the in the uh, event. But yeah, of course, because guard is just to check um, if if it uh, if it's possible. So no, no write data in the guard. In guard, no, no no writing. You can read it. So if if uh, the example is is pretty obvious. So if you have a user that needs to collect one hundred karma points, mm -hmm. how many karma points do you have? Ninety nine. Sorry, you can't. So it's not it's not uncommon to read from the. Okay. I don't want them in, in one guard. In one guard, like how do I say run guard ABC? Uh, I'm not sure if you can just say ABC. Can I look on guard? Can I look on another guard? Is that a good idea? Uh, no, okay. because you'll fire three events. Sorry. Okay. Uh, you'll fire three events, and uh, all three events will be handled. So you, if you just block one, the the guard will return, the can will return uh, will return false. So you're, you're, you'll be safe. Um, that's the example that I was uh, telling you, uh, telling the, the gentleman uh, over there. So you can have like a generic guard event to just check the user security context. So if it's admin, it can go. But then later on, the guard for that specific workflow and that specific transition can be blocked because the number of karma points is not uh, high enough. Yeah. One more, okay. One more question, and then you'll get to ask me questions on lunch. Yeah.
that's a good question. I haven't tried that. Sorry, uh, because I used uh, I used it only in a Symfony environment, and uh, the 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 Windsor State <coughs> machine I didn't use the the ones there uh, when I was working on a on a, on a Cilius project. Uh, but probably if the, if it's compatible with an interface, you should be you should be good. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I've been uh, unfortunately I've been using the uh, Symphony bundle of that other project, so it was uh, shoved into Symphony. Uh, but yeah, you should probably check to see the bare uh, the bare um, package how it's how it's handled. Okay. Uh, thank you very much.